Thank you for joining us. My name is Mary Pruden, and I'm the director of the National Keratoconus Foundation. We're a patient advocacy organization based at the Department of Ophthalmology in the University of California at Irvine. NKCF provides information to patients and their families and raises public awareness of keratoconus. We invite you to visit our website and sign up for our newsletter and our bi-monthly webinars. We also post news on our Facebook and Instagram pages. This is our new Ask the Expert feature called Chang Reaction. Our partner for this endeavor is Dr. Clark Chang, a noted keratoconus expert and a friend of NKCF. We often receive questions from the public, oftentimes the same questions, and we thought that we would answer them and archive the answers. Dr. Chang is currently the Director of Specialty Contact Lens on the Cornea Service at Wills Eye Hospital in Philadelphia. He's also a member of the medical affairs team at Glaucos. That's the company that makes the FDA approved cross-linking equipment. Dr. Chang is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry and a graduate of the Pennsylvania College of Optometry. He completed advanced cornea and contact lens fellowship at the Cornea and Laser Eye Institute in New Jersey, where he focused on the treatment of keratoconus patients. He participated in some of the early clinical trials for crosslinking. Dr. Chang is a prolific writer, speaker, researcher, and teacher. I'm also proud to report that Dr. Chang was named the top doc by NKCF last year. Hi, Dr. Chang. Hi, Mary. I feel like I now I now that you just mentioned that I feel like uh, I should have my trophy next to me. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Mary's going to drop in an image of trophy into my hand. <laughs> <laughs> okay, since this is the first Chang reaction that we're recording, we're going to start with the most common question we receive. Okay. People all often contact us and say they've just been told that they or a loved one has keratoconus. They can't believe they've been diagnosed with this eye disease and they can't even pronounce it and they never heard of it. They want to make sure their doctor isn't wrong. So, Dr. Chang, what are the symptoms of keratoconus? Well, thank you, Mary, for having me here. And uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, listening in and logging in and checking out our uh, podcast. So let's talk about keratoconus. Uh, it, it is a word not uh, commonly heard and difficult to spell. Uh, I'm known to sometimes switch my N and U at some point when I'm lecturing, people point to, out to me that I have a typo. So I'm completely with our patients in that it is, it sounds scary, it's hard to understand, you've never heard of it, what exactly is it? So let's quickly break down the word keratoconus. As it relates to the structure of your eyes, kerato, the first part of the word, uh, means your cornea, and that is the outer front covering. Uh, that is dome-like and clear uh, in the front part of your eye. And here you can see on this slide, I have an arrow pointed to the fact that it has two thirds of the overall power of your eye. So it's the very outer component or compartment uh, of the eye. The second part of the word conus uh, means that it's a shape that is, uh, that is cone-like or a conical shape. So that to put together, it means that the shape of your eye, rather than maintaining a very smooth and round uh, curvature or curvatures as, if, uh, as on a healthy cornea with no disease, a keratoconus eye means the shape of the eye slowly bulges forward and more and more and eventually, and by that I mean the corneal shape slowly bulges forward and eventually can become more and more cone-like. And that is the reason why it's called keratoconus. And in a simplistic view, if you would, what kind, what does that do to somebody's vision if you have keratoconus when the shape of your eye changes? Um, so again, in a simple view, you can think of the shape of your eye as a very high power magnifying glass. Everybody has seen those, right? Like in a detective movie where you have a magnifier and most people have kind of touched it in the, I remember as a kid, you know, you tried to, uh, use the energy of the sun and see if you could kind of start a small fire on the leaf or something like that. Why does that happen? Because the shape of your magnifying glass, it's smooth and round 
and it converges the, uh, the light ray coming from the sun into a single point. And that energy builds and builds and eventually has enough thermal energy to start uh, a fire, if you would, a small one. Uh, we're not arsonists here. Um, but um, the, so as the shape of the eye of your cornea changes, and that the slope of, the, of your cornea becomes more and more asymmetrical on either side of the, of the peak at the center, um, then what would happen is the, the light rays no longer gets converged into a single point after it enters the eye. So it doesn't form, um, it, you need that in order to form a single focusable point that can be delivered to the photoreceptor layers in the back of your eye, in your retina, before the images and the signal gets transmitted through your optic nerve to your visual cortex in your brain. So a lot going on in order for vision to actually occur or to be perceived. So with the keratoconus, again, because of the shape of the cornea becomes very asymmetrical um, and becomes more and more cone-like, the light ray actually gets, um, becomes unfocused. So it's spread across a larger area rather than being converged to form a single focusable point. And so at the beginning, it makes the image rather blur and very fuzzy around the edges. And um, very similar to how you would look at an image quality as say, if anybody remembers what a cathode ray TV screen looks like. So the image is very low definition, if you would, and the edge is very fuzzy and almost like you're seeing a little bit of a ghosting image, um, which is because the light rays are not being focused. Whereas compared to like our modern day high definition resolution monitor, everything's very sharp. Um, hopefully you're not seeing any wrinkles or defects on my skin, but you know, that, that's sort of our, that's what happens when the shape of the eye is not round and smooth. So not only does it create, um, it creates ghosting images, if the shape of the eye becomes even more asymmetrical, meaning it bulges forward, but much more so in the lower part than the upper part, more symptoms can occur, such as halo. Looking at light, you'll see a ring of light around an actual light image on top of that ghosting image. And you can also have blur vision that cannot be corrected by glasses because it's due to the shape of the eye. It's nothing to do with prescription of the eye. And people can then also become very light sensitive because you, when you look at light, you don't see a focus anymore in the real world. And we have so much light around us. So you start seeing all these defects and even double vision or, tri or triple vision or even worse than that, such as the picture of the moon that you saw a little bit earlier. And a lot of people also complain about looking at headlights um, at night when they're driving and that there is star bursting or this sort of bleeding radial pattern of the light. And that's again, because your light ray is not being converged by the shape of the cornea. And although I've spent that much time talking about all these symptoms, I bet you haven't noticed that in one of the pictures, there's actually somebody standing next to that headlight. So there you could actually see that there is, there is that person. Um, so Imagine the safety, not only as a bystander, if you have keratoconus and not being able to, able to see exactly where the car body is when it's coming at you or next to you, but also if you're the driver and not being able to see maybe you know, pedestrian as well as you should, which brings about a lot of anxiety for patients, and especially because you know, their symptoms cannot be corrected depending on the staging of the keratoconus and how sort of the shape how much it's more is it's taking on that conical formation. Um, it can get worse and worse and harder and harder to uh, be corrected with soft lenses and glasses to the point where people may have a hard time going out during the day when it's really sunny. A lot of my patients, um, obviously, when you are given the proper tool like specialty content lenses or medical content lenses, and that we'll talk about uh, a little bit later and, and I'm sure in the future as well, you do a lot better, but there are patients who, you know, with glasses uh, cannot really go out at night, even with sunglasses or with a cap, um, because it's very difficult to not be distracted by all these light images. Or when everybody's vision drops at night, no different with keratoconus patients, it can, in, but except that their differential is even more, they not only see your star bursting, your halo, your ghosting and double images, or even multiple images, 
And so just imagine putting all that together and not to mention blurry vision that your general soft disposable lenses or glasses typically won't fix. Um, and they also go through, um, you know, a lot of uh, frustration with the fact that they keep going to see the eye doctors and their prescription keeps changing, but they only, the glasses prescription only, no matter how it's changed, only offers very little help. And that builds up anxiety and frustration in the patient's mind. And so it becomes harder and harder um, for them to be able to really function or feel independent. Um, and um, one thing that I also, before we go to the next question, I want everybody to understand, I know that I'm talking about the fact that the shape of the eye kind of bulges forward and looking more like a cone rather than being rounded. Um, understand that it, it's only a, my, a very microscopic shift in the cornea, not the entire part of the eye. So it's not like you're going to see somebody with very sort of bulgy, uh, forward-looking eye. Um, and that is one, I guess, silver lining that you're not going to be able to visualize the deformation of the cornea just by, uh, you know, somebody looking at you at conversation distance unless they have the instruments that we have in the office to look. Um, but uh, that sort of lack of um, observable, if you would, physical deformation also brings, a, brings about a lot of uh, misunderstandings and misconception. By that, I mean because you can't really visualize for people who are not keratoconus patients, you can't really look at a keratoconus patient and say, oh, I see some sort of deformation or disability. Um, and therefore, because that's not being viewed by people around keratoconus patients and because of visual challenges that they perceive and not sometimes not being able to you know, have all the visual symptoms and not be able to go out uh, at night or during the day when it's really bright, they a lot of times carry on the stigma of being very unmotivated or unfocused and sometimes even lazy. So we need to do better uh, in serving our keratoconus patients um, so that that misconception is not being pinned on these patients. Um, and that it would be, hopefully everybody got that, that would be my summary of what the general symptoms would be for a keratoconus patient. Well, thanks, Dr. Chang. That was um, very helpful to see pictures that sort of show the different symptoms. Uh, I think that will help people describe what they're seeing and what they're experiencing when they go to the eye doctor. So after uh, people realize that they probably do have keratoconus based on some of the um, pictures that you shared, uh, we get another very common question. And that is, will I become blind from keratoconus? Right. And, and I, Mary, you hear that a lot, and I hear that a lot as well. And um, with all the visual symptoms and challenges that we just talked about, um, we're all there with our keratoconus patients every step of the way, you know, on their journey. The keratoconus is uh, a progressive disease. At least uh, we believe in, in certain uh, life cycles, patients are more and more, more likely to get worse, typically when you're young so, or younger. So, uh, you know, from your, you know, early teenage years to, you know, sometime late 30s, early 40s, that's the life cycle where we believe people are more likely to get worse uh, at a faster rate. Um, again, especially if they're younger. Um, but And so as keratoconus gets worse, as their vision becomes harder and harder to be corrected by glasses or your standard soft lenses, um, the remember we talked about the shape of the eye, that analogy of the magnifier having a smooth round shape. So as the corneal curvature becomes more and more um, cone-like or asymmetrical, because the area of the bulge is going to have very different set of curvature compared to the area that doesn't bulge forward, right? So the asymmetry become greater and greater. It is true that their vision becomes, there's a lot of noise that fills their vision before it's being passed on to the visual cortex in the brain. Um, and therefore, people always have the question of, well, how much more vision am I going to lose? So perhaps one silver lining is that the it, there are a lot of components in your visual pathway that needs to work in sync for you to have your best vision. Your cornea is one major component because it determines the power of the system, but that's not, it's not the only. So if think about uh, a satellite TV, if you would, in this picture. 
So in order for you to watch TV, um, you can sense that I really like to watch TV because a lot of my examples are going to be computer screen or TV screen. But anyway, so in order for you to sit in front of a TV to watch TV, um, a few things have to work, right? You're going to have signal being beamed up to the satellite, being passed down from the satellite, and then you need to have a receiver to receive the signal, and then that gets kind of routed to the cable and to the decoder, and then the receiver, uh, and then finally uh, being uh, displayed on your TV screen. So, in, in imagine that um, your so imagine that your optic nerve in the back of the eye is the receiver and the cable to the screen. Um, you, your keratoconus is your satellite signal, right? So your as the satellite is beaming signal down to the to Earth, um, even if you have a really rainy day and your signal is not very strong, you still see images on TV. It just it's just that you have a lot of uh, snow signals um, or a lot of visual noises on the signal. So what I'm trying to say is you will still have signal going to your brain in your visual cortex, even if you have keratoconus, no matter what stage. So you're not going to de de you're not going to develop complete blindness. By that, we mean the inability to perceive any amount of light. Okay. So silver lining is there. You don't develop complete blindness, but because of the fact that the keratoconus patients are very difficult, sometimes impossible to be corrected by standard conventional means like your standard glasses. And therefore you get a lot of blurriness, you get a lot of ghosting, halo star bursting, um, that kind of thing, but you don't ever really lose the ability to perceive light. So it's the sort of the difference between legally blind versus completely blind. And so for keratoconus patients, just kind of one more time, because I want everybody to understand and feel comfortable, you will not, you, it is very unlikely to develop complete blindness with keratoconus patients with this condition. Well, that's very reassuring. Thanks very much. Let's, um, let's take a question now that's especially relevant these days. At the beginning of the pandemic, there was lots of advice about hand washing and avoiding touching your face. I think it was because of these warnings that people became very concerned about wearing their contacts. You've probably been asked by your patients about wearing contacts during COVID-19. Tell me what you tell them. Sure. And I hope that in the playback of our uh a podcast that nobody has caught how many times I've touched my face. I hope this answer is zero. I'm really <laughs> trying very difficult not to. So it is a very difficult thing and that I completely understand where the uh, concern uh, came from when, you know, the pandemic started. And obviously, you know, looking forward for uh, us to return and be able to resume a lot of our normal activities um, in the future with vaccination and, and uh, things like that. But coming back to the question, um, what about our COVID-19 pandemic? Can I still safely wear glasses? Remember what in earlier today, we talked about the fact that these patients require, uh, cannot be correct, keratoconus patients cannot, most of them cannot be corrected with glasses or your regular soft lenses. And therefore they need to wear medical contact lenses or specialty contact lenses which is typically a harder lens material that maintains its shape so that when it's being placed on the eye, it can mask the irregular shape on the cornea, very similar to the image that I'm showing you here, so that the light rays can now be converged again into a single image uh, focusable point to be delivered to the photoreceptors in the back of the eye. Why am I saying that? Um, it's not just because I like to work with people who need these medical contact lenses, but we, it's because keratoconus patients need these contact lens devices um, to be able to function, to be able to perform, uh, you know, participate in athletic activities or go to work and, you know, be safe going up downstairs and driving. So we need to kind of, we need to also assess like everything we do in life, we need to assess benefit and risks um, and, and as well safety. So since keratoconus patients really need to wear glasses. They're at a different level when you're judging whether when we are assessing the risk and benefit level of uh, during this pandemic um, time. But also, let me take one quickly one step back. We really don't currently have uh, data that shows that 
um, glasses is any safer than contact lenses in terms of you know transmitting um, in, in terms of whether or not either modalities can transmit SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes uh, COVID-19, um, whether or not either of the tool, which one is more risky in terms of, or may, or, or and, and the answer could be neither, um, could, you know, is, is a vector to transmit that into your body. It is true that there are some cases that they have rarely, they've isolated uh, the virus itself in a tear film of patients with COVID-19 but it is in very small amount and it's also very rare in the in uh, very rare cases that have been uh, reported or have virus isolated in the tear film and therefore we believe the risk is very low in terms of be transmitting that condition uh, or covid-19 from your tear film into your own body however if you don't need to wear contact lenses because you don't have keratoconus Obviously, I think that's a, a reasonable uh, that's a you know a reasonable approach. But when you medically need to wear contact lenses in order to keep you and people around you safe and in order to have you continue to be able to perform your daily activities, that's a whole different ball game. And the fact that the the fact that the uh, the risk is very low makes it so that you can continue to wear contact lenses, um, especially these medical contact lenses during this time. However, I think you should regardless of whether or not your, you know, people, your uh, patients with no um, keratoconus, but you wear soft lenses, or if your keratoconus patients wearing medical contact lenses, I think you at least need to abide by um, two general rules. Number one, maintain good hygiene as recommended by CDC as well as World Health Organization, uh, and also maintain good contact lens hygiene. So let's quickly talk about those two. For good hand hygiene, Follow the recommendations, like I said, from CDC and World Health Organization on frequent hand washing throughout the day uh, with soap uh, and water, soap for at least 20 seconds or longer, and then follow by drying with a uh, lint-free paper towel um, so you don't pass any, hopefully don't pass any uh, fiber onto your eye or the lens, um, just you know because they could potentially be uncomfortable. Um, so, and also make sure that you don't touch your contact lenses or glasses uh, with unwashed hands. And once you place your contact lens uh, or glasses um, you know, in, on the eye or on your face, avoid touching your, um, your ears, um, your, um, your nose, your eyes, or your mouth um, so that you don't um, you know, pass that around uh, onto your uh, glasses material or even your contact lens. So that's number one. Number two, what is good contact lens hygiene? Well, obviously follow your uh, eye care professional's recommendation on disinfecting your lenses at the end of the day if they're not daily disposable. And for keratoconus patients, these medical contact lenses don't rarely are they daily disposable type of lenses. So make sure you follow your lens uh, disinfection instruction given by your eye care professional. Uh, make sure you replace them on time so that if they're not daily disposable, make sure you don't overwear them over the time period there, uh, the lenses are meant to be prescribed. And definitely do not swim, uh, shower, or sleep in your contact lenses while you have the contact lenses on the eyes, as that is more likely to lead to the rate of infection is a lot higher if you do any of those three activities. And now is not really the time to send you into uh, different clinics uh, if you don't need to. So I like to reduce the number of times my patients are visiting me during this time. And the best way is to keep them as safe as possible by not getting infection related to contact lens wear that has nothing to do with COVID-19. Um, so make sure you follow those rules. Uh, and it, as, a, as a, uh, a cardinal rule of all contact lens wear, COVID-19 or not, if you are feeling unwell, particularly if you have the symptoms of uh, flu-like symptom, or you feel like you're coming down with a cold or malaise um, or chill or anything like that, um, you definitely should stop wearing your contact lenses, contact uh, and, and monitor yourself. And if any type of uh, red eye or conjunctivitis uh, develops, again, very rare manifestation of uh, COVID-19, However, if that does develop, then make sure that you continue to stop where to not wear your contact lenses and contact your eye care professional to seek the advice of your eye doctors. 
So that would be, that is how I communicate with my patients with regard to their safety around contact lens wear during this pandemic. Mary? Thank you, those are very helpful uh, tips. Uh, we'll, we'll wrap up tonight with one more question that comes up frequently. One of the resources that's available at NKCF is our doctor referral list. We have about 380 optometrists and ophthalmologists from across the United States who are on our expert list. All of them have done extra training in the specialty. I'd like to ask you about what a patient should be looking for when selecting an eye doctor. Maybe mm -hmm. you can address the difference between an optometrist and an ophthalmologist. Sure, I'd be happy to. Thank you for that question, Mary. Um, so there are um, obviously your respective or of uh, capabilities. Not all eye doctors, whether optometrists or ophthalmologists, specialize in keratoconus treatments. Um, and that's sort of just the reality of limitation of resources, right? We can't all be specialized in the same clinical area of interest. Um, and so typically when patients, if they're not close enough uh, to me, or I have obviously a lot of patients who will fly to, you know, from out of state or out of country to see me, but uh, that's obviously not what I'm encouraging you to do during this time. Um, but again, so you typically if people ask me for, hey, where can I look up um, resources for doctors near me, I typically give them my personal top two uh, web resources. One, Mary had just mentioned, is the physician locator on uh, National Keratoconus Foundation. And the second is uh, living on keratoconus, living, I'm sorry, livingwithkeratoconus.com. Don't listen to what I say, but look at what's on the screen. Um, but uh, the uh, and it's the difference between the two is that uh, right now is that the uh, NKCF uh, physician locator can, includes both optometrists and ophthalmologist. Whereas livingwithkeratoconus.com uh, are uh, ophthalmologists who are cornea specialists. So what are the differences, um, or at least what are the differences when it comes to treating keratoconus patients? Your ophthalmologist are, your, uh, would be the specialist who will uh, perform medical and uh, um, surgical procedures, and that could be, you know, your corneal transplant, for example, would be an, uh, would be a, a, an example of uh, of a, a, a corneal surgery that your ophthalmologist uh, can perform as a as a corneal specialist. Whereas your optometrist, think of them more as your family doctor for the eye, your primary care um, eye doctors. So they are there to. Um, give you long-term monitoring, help you with the need for glasses and contact lenses, dilate your eyes to make sure that the general eye health, that you're, you, know, you don't have glaucoma, that you don't have cataract, your pressure um, is not too high, that kind of thing that you uh, are very familiar with uh, to have done to you as a patient during a regular eye exam. So that would be your, um, the optometrist that can do that for you at the primary care level. And they can, of, of course, also uh, prescribe specialty contact lenses uh, to you if you are uh, patients living with keratoconus. Uh, and, you know, there's rarely does an ophthalmologist have time to do that. So that typically in terms of keratoconus treatment, um, because we want our specialists to spend more time, you know, treating patients with surgery and medical procedures. Um, so that's typically um, how the two professions can be viewed as being positioned in the um, ongoing care of a keratoconus patient. Although it is worth pointing out that the two often come together to make sure that the patient is receiving the best, uh, best advice and best care. Thank you. Do, Dr. Chang, do most of your patients have an ophthalmologist and an optometrist on their team, or do you usually have one and then just go to the other one for a referral? Uh, most of my so most of most of my patients would have both. Um, so okay. I'm fortunate that at Will's Eye, um, I have, you know, I'm I'm working with a team of of uh, ophthalmologists. So they all, you know, come to they get their patients to come see me for my opinion on how to maximize their vision, what kind of medical contact lenses should we do, and whether it's keratoconus or other eye condition. And so I would stay, I spend a lot of time with a patient and I would monitor them for 
um, you know, in terms of carrier conus to make sure that they are not progressing. But if they are, then I would be referring referring my patients back to see the ophthalmologist, the cornea specialist that I work with, and then they can assess them for other treatment prior to um, sort of getting back to me to um, take care of them with contact lenses after a specific surgery. So the cycle kind of goes on there. Um, so we do typically work as a team, and in my mind, that sort of interdisciplinary mo disciplinary model really benefits my keratoconus patients. Thank you um, for taking the time to answer some of the questions that we get and for clarifying some of the, the um, confusion that some people have. I hope the people who are listening also found it helpful. And next month, we'll, po we'll do this again. We'll post another Chang reaction with more answers to more questions about keratoconus. I will be here. <laughs> yeah, if anyone is listening, uh, has a question that they'd like answered by Dr. Chang in a future episode, go to the NKCF website, that's nkcf.org, and under the tab that's for patients, you'll find something called Ask the Expert Chang Reaction. You can put your confidential question there and we will uh, send it to Dr. Chang and hopefully he will answer it in an upcoming episode. In closing, I want to thank him for taking time out of his very, very, very busy schedule to speak with us. And I want to um, put in a note to everybody who's listening and who will listen to this. And KCF is a, is a nonprofit. We operate with the support of our friends and donors. If you feel the urge to support us based on what you're hearing tonight, our newsletters, uh, our webinars, and some of the other information we, we share with you, we hope you'll take time to make an online gift made to the UCI Foundation, um, which you can find on the NKCF website. I want to um, especially thank the company Glaucos, who has provided a generous educational grant that we are using to print and mail materials that we send to patients and their support has helped chain reaction become a reality join us next month when dr chang will answer more questions about all things keratoconus thanks a lot bye-bye dr chang bye-bye bye mary thank you everybody see you next time <laughs>